Thank you again, everyone, for joining Gabbing About Gardening, featuring today's garden guest, garden guest teacher, Jane Squire. Jane has over 40 years experience growing organically, growing hydroponically, growing in greenhouses. She is a horticulturist living and growing and working on Salt Spring Island. And Jane is with us today to tell us her amazing story of transforming a piece of land, uh, growing a greenhouse, creating an oasis and growing tropical fruits, citrus fruits, avocados. And she's going to show us and tell us how. Jane, are you with us here? I'm looking for you. Hi. You are, Jane. Welcome to Gabbing About Gardening. Well, thanks for inviting me. You know, I, I read your amazing story or, you know, a bit of your story because you have quite a story that extends for quite a long time and through doing all kinds of amazing things. But I, I read it in the National Observer and as soon as I read your story, I thought, oh, I've got to see if this amazing teacher, horticulturist, will come on gabbing about gardening and, and tell us about greenhouse gardening. So thank you so much for being here. We're very grateful. More than welcome. Um, yeah, I, I have a slide presentation which, which goes through um, pretty much the last um, 15 years or so of just developing. Um, it's my journey to where, where I am now with my um, subtropical greenhouse. Excellent. We're, we're all ears and I've just made you co-host Jane. So, um, you know, if you, if you would like to start your presentation now, or if you would like to give us a little background, um, whatever works for you, but you me, are, you are in control well. now. I might as well start. I'll just see if I can share my screen properly. How's that? Perfect. I guess our our uh, faces are in the way of some of the printing there. But um, yeah, I wanted to share some of my um, some of the fun I'm having on my property. And uh, I, I've been working with various, um, various technologies for the last um, 15 years or so. And uh, really, really trying to pay attention to my ecological footprint, not only my energy consumption, but um, how I'm uh, using resources um, for growing. So um, we, we purchased this property in 1993 and it's uh, three acres. And that lawn that you see there with the cherry trees was actually just a field of broom, very tall broom, which we had to get a big saw in and just take it all down. And then there's um, two acres of Douglas fir forest. And when we bought the place, it was completely dark looking into the forest. Um, and after about six years, somebody just, they just went around and they were um, clearing the adjoining properties. And um, so you can see through the forest now. And when we bought the property, there were um, a bunch of uh, standing dead trees, quite large Douglas fir from some uh, changes in the hydrology. And uh, we were able to take those down and, and build our house with them. So when we moved to this property, we were leaving Alberta where we had a fairly large um, hydroponic greenhouse. And we sold uh, developed that over a 10 year period and um, sold it turnkey and just kind of wanted to get to a, just maintain kind of a lifestyle business. So we, um, we brought a greenhouse with us, a gutter connected greenhouse, which we thought would be the appropriate size for a lifestyle business. Um, in, in Alberta, we were part of sort of the early wave of hydroponic growers back in, in the early eighties. 
And so there was a lot of interest in hydroponics and um, kind of a really great extension services that were provided through the government. So we, uh, we had a pretty exciting time there. So we came here with this uh, gutter connected greenhouse. It's a 6,000 square feet. And uh, to start with, we were burning propane and then we, we really had no idea how humid this place was. So we were making a very drippy environment. So we didn't move to oil. We were doing um, year round production of, of butterhead lettuce and we had to apply for a quota through the government because butterhead lettuce was actually a quota product, believe it or not. So um, that took a few years, but we did manage to get that. And uh, here I am heading to work from my house. And so we ran this for uh, until um, 2000. Um, unfortunately, my marriage didn't survive island life. So I was uh, able to um, eventually buy out and, and operate the greenhouse by myself. And what was really a very part-time job for two people became more than one person could really handle. So I, I had to really design a lot of different things to, to make it manageable for me. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the butterhead lettuce growing in hydroponic system. And you can see the, um, the basil there. Um, so I, I was doing full year production of lettuce and at all times having 10 crops um, so that you had, I, I would be able to, to um, sell to the stores every single week of the year because, um, because I had constant planting and constant production. And then the basil, I took advantage of the heat in the summertime and, um, and would grow basil from about, um, I'd have my first harvest in April and then I would have my last, um, usually mid-October, when um, it would just start getting too cold at night time for it to do really well. And when I changed this system with, with uh, different types of lettuce and basil, uh, I was able to stop having to deliver off island. So that made, that just a, took a whole chunk of time and um, freed it up for me to do other things. Here I am planting out the lettuce and the lettuce goes into these troughs and I'm planting three at a time. Um, and these seedlings are grown on seedling trays and, and in the summertime, it's from seed to harvest is about 40, 43 days. And in the winter time, it's about 107. And if in Alberta, it's much shorter because they get such sunny winters. But here, I, I, don't, I didn't do any supplementation of lighting or anything, so, and pretty minimal temperatures. But the beauty of this system for one person is you can actually make a really decent living growing this way because the uh, plants get planted out and then you don't touch them again till they're ready to harvest. You never have to deal with weeding or, and you just, I have a machine that's to the right there on that cement pad and I just hook the trough cover up to the machine, turn the machine on and the whole crop comes right up to waist tight to a, to a packaging area. So it, it's, it was quite a, it was a fabulous business. One of the things about the property was that we had absolutely no, no water, no access to water. And um, we were on a community water system and had an agreement that we wouldn't put a well in. And that really didn't phase us because, because really for hydroponics, you also wanna have rainwater. Anyhow, you wanna start with nothing in the water. So, um, so I, my, I got these above ground swimming pools through um, buy and sell at that time. People didn't realize how valuable they were. So you could get them sometimes for free. And I have um, 70,000 imperial gallons of storage on the property, which is um, five months of full production, including any horticulture outside of the greenhouse. Um, five months of no rain, it's enough for that. So um, when um, my kids all kind of grew up and were heading out the door, I started to um, really look at um, changing systems and um, uh, look at efficiencies, but also like this footprint thing I was talking about. And, and so I, um, 
I started to design some trials of how I might approach taking the vegetative waste on my property, all the compost and the various things, and how could I turn that actually into a nutrient solution and just carry on growing hydroponically with some of the waste from my property. And uh, in the early days of hydroponics, um, the thing was that you were trying to have everything as sterile as possible. And you would see these, these go into a hydroponic greenhouse and you'd see people with lab coats and, and booties on and they would be paranoid that it would bring some insect or disease into the greenhouse. And around the uh, 2001 or two, I had a friend who had cancer and she came in and she said to me, you know, it's really important that you don't use any fungicides in your production because it's essentially like killing, it's, it's, you're stopping the immune system of the plant right at the get-go. And the plant is completely reliant on you using inputs to protect it instead of itself building. And even what they started to realize in hydroponic production was, yes, you could have a biotic um, environment where plants were actually building their immune systems, where you were having, um, in, in the water, you would, you would have add some, some types of bacteria and things that would actually help the plants. And so this was like changing um, the attitude towards uh, sterile environments. So I was all in on that. And I had frogs in my greenhouse and rivets and when they would get too loud and uh, the snakes would come in and they'd eat them. And uh, this, the frogs, you'd see them swimming down the trough, just, enjoying themselves. Anyhow, I, I, I wanted to learn more about this. So I actually started taking courses um, at UBC on agroecology and uh, University of um, Massachusetts on systems. And I went on a tour to Cuba with uh, Ron Pither. It was an agricultural tour. And we met all these fabulous people there that were doing really innovative work in the agroponicos. Um, with vermiculture and with foliar applications from, from compost extracts. And, and um, so I, I really tried to, to read as much as I could to, to start to plan my next phase. And one of the things that I did was I, I did get into some vermiculture and as in um, Cuba, they would use these old hydroponic troughs to um, grow the, the uh, put their compost in there and grow the worms. And then when they, when um, the, the compost was all ready, then they would flood it and the worms would all come up to the top. They'd scoop them off and throw them into the next bin. And then they would use that liqueur. They had a tap, a, a spigot at the bottom and they would drain it off and they would use it for all kinds of uh, um, uh, foliar sprays and soil amendments and things like that. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna start all these trials. So I was making teas, making vermicast uh, liqueurs and very naively figured I could get a hundred foot run out of this stuff. And about five feet down the trough, it turned into this stinky, disgusting mess because it was, I really didn't understand the chemistry of how much oxygen is required to break down organic matter into a liquid that's stable. So, it, you know, I tried, but I, I didn't have much, much success until I, this, uh, fertilizer company sent me a product and said, hey, try this. And uh, they hadn't started selling it, but they were wondering how, how it worked at my place. So I, I tried this stuff and I put it into um, solution and I you know, monitored the pH and the electrical conductivity. And sure enough, the stuff worked. It was stable, it was incredible. So I thought, wow, it's digestate that works. And digestate is what comes out of an anaerobic digester. Um, it's a process that really duplicates what a cow, in this is circumstance, what a cow's stomach does. You use methanobacteria inside a, a contained, um, a, an, um, a container that has, um, that's, uh, uh, has no oxygen coming into it. And, it. and you have this breakdown of all of the, uh, the um, vegetables by this methanobacteria. And then out comes this nice finished fertilizer. And of course you get this, the uh, methane as well, which you can scrub and use for other things. So there's two things that come out of a, out of a um, digester. And here's 
some of my trials with um, this and I worked with um, somebody um, who was who had a student and we were you know monitoring our results and then my partner um, had to go had to go for medical treatment in India at this research station and I went along with him and uh, turned out that this place had this massive anaerobic digester so now I was really seeing how it worked this is a uh, 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 Dr. Vijay Kumar, who's an um, aeronautics engineer, and he had designed a really fancy generator that could run with no no lubrications. And he was using he he required this very high quality methane, and he created this complicated scrubber system, which is on the right. Um, but he could get ninety four percent methane. Anyhow, he was it was like going to school being there, and he had created this little mini mini machine that he thought that the government would buy these and, and subsidize them going out to villages. But he went and duplicated all the really sophisticated scrubbing system for the gas, which I can only imagine that it would just have been a nightmare for any anybody to try and maintain one of these things. But I thought, hey, I should get one. So I did try to import one, but uh, he, they, you know, I was just off the radar as soon as I left. But I did meet this young man, Keelan Gell from Off Grid Gas, who uh, studied in Holland uh, digesters and was a, a engineer and he created these small scale digesters. And this is the one I bought. I, I bought this probably, I think it's 11 or 12 years ago. And um, this whole unit, I have a YouTube on this if you're, if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, this is a way a small farm can actually have um, like animal manure without having animals. <laughs> and can control it. And I put all my stinky, gross kitchen stuff in there. The stuff rats would like, everything rats would like goes in there. And I don't have to ever worry about that kind of thing. What comes out the other end smells just like manure. And I have a constant supply of methane, which I use uh, for various projects, including um, distilling essential oils. So this is what the, the the digester looked like when it was finally covered up and um, I have solar um, system, I've got a grid tie with, um, I set that up with a, a battery backup system for, with an essential load. Um, so I can have about a week of running greenhouse and essential things um, with my system. Here I am um, with trials from the digest state in the greenhouse. I had a third of the greenhouse that was empty now because um, I, I Prices were changing in California and I was making the same amount of money or more actually with two thirds of the greenhouse. So it freed up a whole area for me to fool around with. And this would be winter production. This would be, oh, no, it wouldn't be because there's some basil. So, um, but these are, I lifted all these troughs up so that there was a way to pump and drain um, because it wasn't part of my, my uh, other system. So this is what the greenhouse looked like in the winter time. Um, this is the empty area. When we built the greenhouse, we scraped all the topsoil off. That would have been in 1994. So there was absolutely only subsoil in here. And there was plastic on top of there, but there must have been a bit of, uh, uh, you know, stuff overflowing into that area. But um, then I, I just started to think, what am I going to do with this place? You know, it's just so much empty space. and um, I, I just started to uh, do some dreaming and uh, um, when I went to Mexico with my partner and we, uh, I just got remembered how much I love citrus and avocado trees. So we, while we were in Mexico, um, we started designing this and um, I, I was uh, thinking there's half the greenhouse with trees in it and it's a pretty simplistic drawing, but um, that was kind of a, the first iteration of, of uh, this. And I, I already had met Bob and Verna um, Duncan, who many of you must know. And they were, um, they, I contacted them and I said, you know, told them how much, how many trees I wanted. And I was able to get in on an order and, um, and actually was lucky to get in on an avocado order because I, they had real problems getting those. That was, I ordered them in 2013. So, um, so, so this is a video which um, the sound 
I've found when I do this doesn't work. Uh, but this this is actually on my YouTube, but it's one of the first ones I, I did. But it shows, this is the first day. So I, I pulled the plastic part and this cat's already been operating for uh, probably about four hours. And um, so so I just thought I'd, I'd turn this on and, and um, you can kind of see what would happen. And I, I'll explain it as we go along. Oops, no, I went. Now I have to go backwards. Uh oh. How do I go backwards? It's going to go backwards. There we are. Um, so because it's this, you can't hear the sound. But anyhow, this is showing that the design that I came up with was di digging cubic meter holes for each single tree, and. I was going to end up with 25, sorry for the shakiness, I was going to end up with 25 cubic yards of fill that um, I, I didn't want to have to drag it out of the greenhouse. And of course, we're always thinking about north walls and insulating them, at least I am. But I found this system um, online called Hyper Adobe. It's like the third generation of a sandbag wall. And it's using the mesh from onion skin, uh, from onion bags that you get at the grocery store. So I bought like a 3,000 foot roll of that stuff. And you make like a sausage um, of this stuff and then you tamp it down. So all we did was take the rocks out of the fill and then um, put them into the bags. This big hole here is because I had an extra swimming pool and um, it, the, I got it for free, but the bottom was um, rusted out. So there's no way I could use it anywhere else. But I thought, oh, I could put it in there. So part of the idea was to have thermal mass. So I put insulation all around the pool and uh, when it was installed and um, it holds 4,500 gallons. But at any rate, this is the system you can see filling up the containers with this fill. And luckily I, I do have a percentage of uh, clay in there. So it, it compacts really beautiful beautifully. And I we built these little bump outs just to stabilize the wall. And those have Meyer lemons in them now. Um, the wall ended up being four feet tall. And there's a space there. You can see the air space there behind the wall goes up to the to the poly. And um, that that's just like helping to the cold air will tumble if the vents have to be open, the cold air tumbles behind that wall and uh, it just stabilized, the temperature stabilized by the wall. So um, this system is amazing. And we, I think this is like after four or five hours of having a work bee. So I had a bunch of work bees with um, my friends and we just put this wall together really quickly. Now, any, if you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll field them at the end of this um, this talk. But you can see the subsoil here that it's it's pretty orange. There's not a lot of a lot of stuff in there. But clay, of course, is always nice to work with. As a, it's nice to have in your in your uh, soil. So um, now I have to stop this and move to the next one. So this is what the pool looked like after it was finished. And um, there's insulation all the way around the sides. There's the three inch styrofoam insulation on the bottom. It's two feet dug down. And so two feet up is that wall. And uh, the, the way that you use this hyper adobe is that you create a mud afterwards because the plastic only lasts about six months before it starts, the sun starts to break it down. Um, so I just use the same fill, bit of straw, bit of, of, of sand, um, flax, boiled flax, and, um, and just mudded the whole thing and it, it's worked really well. So here's the little trees, these are avocados. And so you can see the whole, so I, I had the, the subsoil analyzed and um, had integrity soils in um, Saanich make me an amendment that would bring my pH and my organic matter up. And I used um, that product, that mycorrhizal product called Mike. 
um, I didn't know much about how, that I could actually access other stuff. So, and, and actually, those are that's kind of like the early years of people really using these um, mycorrhizal um, inoculants. But uh, I did add that because, of course, this is like sterile environment. I actually brought in sterile compost because I was worried about bringing in insects and weeds and all kinds of stuff. But I really didn't have the awareness that I now have of how important biology is. So this greenhouse was, um, I, my idea was that I would help keep these trees dwarf by having these small, um, well, these cubic meter holes for the trees um, that they wouldn't be, you know, racing through the greenhouse getting too big. So it was, it was an idea I have. I don't, I'm, I'm not sorry I did that, but I, there is a lot of, of hard, dense subsoil that's about one inch below uh, a bunch of compost that's accumulated. So here I am with my production. I'm doing both things at the same time. Uh, did this for quite a few years. And um, here I grew in some areas. I did dig the ground a bit and added about a, a, some amendment and grew peanuts. And here's what it looks like with more of the citrus trees. And the cement mixer is to make the adobe. You can see that the back wall is now mudded. So in the winter time, I followed Bob Duncan's system. I, I um, was trying to, to wean myself off of oil. I actually took my furnace because I knew I'd burn oil if I had it in there. I took my furnace and got it out of the greenhouse and um, just used the Christmas lights on a thermostat against a tree and then covered them with reme. And that was how I went through. And you can see here that the troughs are empty because now I'm into eight month production. I'm getting the price of everything still going up. <laughs> I'm still making as much money, you know, doing eight month production. So, um, and so I I'm, I'm have these trees there and, you know, it starts to get pretty cold and damp in there. And I thought, well, you know, I've got all this methane. I, I put up this, you know, created a few little copper coils and put them in a pot and had it crab pot burner and just thought, I wonder how much I can heat that 4,500 gallons with this little oh, system. And I think in four hours, I, I could, whoops, in four, four and a half hours, I, I might be able to uh, increase the temperature of that 4,500 gallons uh, by half a degree, which, you know, doesn't seem like much, but in a way it is, <laughs> it's something. So I, I didn't enjoy at all this thing about covering and uncovering trees. I, I just thought, you know, the trees are beautiful in the winter. That's when their production is. It's they're, they're, um, they're, the fruit is ripe. Most of these trees, the fruit is ripe between um, November and March, end of March, April. And here they are covered up. And um, I wasn't enjoying this. So I thought, eh, I'm gonna have to look at heating systems. You can see the little trees there. There, there's a little kumquat on the left there, right at the beginning. And that tree always shows deficiencies. So I, I, I ended up. Uh, I'm, I'm with the environmental farm plan. So I was able to um, put together a proposal to get one third funding for um, a uh, high efficiency wood gasifier, uh, hydronic furnace. So um, they, they had a, a program where they were helping farmers get off oil. So I took advantage of that and put in this system. It's a fabulous uh, burner and it heats about 160 gallons of water in its water jacket, but it's so efficient sitting there outside. There's pipes that are insulated that go from the furnace into the greenhouse to a distribution system. But if you had a lot of snow, the snow is actually sitting on top of the furnace while it's operating. It's that well insulated. So this is my old oil furnace that I had taken out of the greenhouse when I was trying to control myself from burning oil. And so now I had an, a use for it. I brought it back in, took the oil burner out and stuck a radiator on top of it and then used all the controls um, with the um, airflow as forced air running past the, the um, radiator. And um, so I was using um, I, I was using forced air system with horizontal fans to circulate 
the temperature. And you can imagine, well, maybe you can't imagine, but I can, that you don't get a heck of a lot of heat out of a furnace like that with a radiator system, but it's enough. My target was to keep above, um, above two degrees and aim for four degrees in the winter time. And because with the research I'd done, the trees would be fine at that temperature. And the other reason that I didn't go for a really big furnace was because I wanted to try to maintain the um, sustainable yield of my forest, um, that little two acre forest. I did some, I found something online where I could calculate what would a sustainable yield be for two acres of Douglas fir forest. And it's, you know, it's pretty, it came up with, I think it was three acres, or sorry, three cords. And so then I thought, okay, I, I can't get a bigger furnace because I'll, I know I'll burn more than three cords. So the incentive is to look at other ways of storing, storing heat and reducing heat loss. But this thing is doing fine and minus nine degrees, the temperature of the greenhouse would be at two degrees. And because uh, I designed the whole system for an eight degree lift. And then underneath my um, seedling area, I put PEX pipes. And so I could heat a seedling area. I had um, Rime, which went over the whole thing. And I ended up having um, styrofoam area that, and also using the fins like, along the um, PEX pipes to distribute the heat better. And it works really well, it's excellent. So of course in the winter time, it's really snowy and cold. And then you go in the greenhouse. This is, you can see the sun shadow, you know, the sun is pretty low there, but it, in a sunny day, it was just beautiful. And so that would be my second winter using a furnace. The first winter, yeah, was with all that Rime. This is a Kaffir lime. This is, or Makrut is the politically correct name for this. This is, I actually sell the leaves of this. Um, to the grocery stores um, for Thai cooking. But the uh, fruit makes an incredible essential oil. It's just, you just touch that plant and you get oil on your hands, it, it, the fruit that is. This is the kumquat, Nagami kumquat. I have three types of kumquat. I have about four types of lemons. I have maybe five or six of mandarins. These are uh, navel oranges. And I think I have three varieties, plus I have uh, Valencia and a few other. I have 35 varieties of citrus. I sometimes, I, this morning I was in bed, I was lying there thinking, no, I don't have 35, but I, I counted them and I sure enough, I do. <laughs> I have pomelo and grapefruit. So in the winter time, I was fooling around a lot. My kids, of course, were getting citrus. I was sending it over to Vancouver, but I was fooling around with different recipes for the first few years. There's limoncello there, which I make a mean limoncello, and uh, dried fruit and uh, salted lemons and marmalades and all kinds of yummy things. And then the spring comes and it's absolutely beautiful. And right now is what it, this is right now. It's, um, it's, it's just an, smells so beautiful and actually people walking by like I don't know how many feet 25 feet away they can on the road they can smell the flowers it's so beautiful here's the avocados this is um this is a, a crop um I'm having pretty good success with avocados though this year is quite worrisome because um very few of the bees made it through on this island in the winter I, I don't see very many pollinators right now most of the avocados that I've gotten are like three quarters to one pound. They're this, the, the one you see on the scale, you can tell it's, it's not quite ripe, but I just wanted to show that it's, what is that? I don't know what that is, but it's, it, they are quite heavy and they're, the flavor is great. I have a Californian friend who said, who said, I gave him one and he said, that's the best avocado I've ever had. And I said, no, come on, you're just being nice to me. And he said, no, I'm really serious. It was, it was really good. So I feel quite happy about that. So 2018 was our last year of having hydroponics. And, um, and this is my friend Hillary helping me harvest. And um, so we would go in between the rows there and, um, and pick into baskets for the basil, but 
as I was telling you before, the lettuce was all automated. So I decided to jump into full production. So um, that's when I did 2018 um, was the last year. And then in 2019, I, I, I upgraded my solar system to um, be able to manage uh, the, um, especially the furnace. That was really the incentive for me was that if I, had, before that time, if I had a power failure, the furnace was hardwired. So I actually couldn't run it in you know, a power failure, but now I'm, everything's fine. So then I decided, okay, I'm, I've got, 2000 square feet left that I can design. And I always wanted to put in a lap pool. So I was thinking, how can I do this? So the other thing I wanted to do was improve the heating system because um, what I really didn't like was that if it was minus nine, I'd have to get up every six hours. So in the middle of the night, I would have to get up to stoke the fire. And uh, there, I, I knew there'd be a better way to do this. So, so I started to figure out how, how I was going to refine the system. The other thing that I started to do then was I started to do workshops on sustainable greenhouse design. Um, weekend workshops. So here we are with uh, a cat because um, I wanted this pool and I wanted it in the ground and I wanted it deep enough that it could I could have some of the moderating effect of um, of the uh, stable temperature in the soil. We decided to go four feet. And this little cat here, um, of course, you can imagine it takes a while to, to dig a great 40 foot long hole that's eight feet wide and four feet deep with a little teeny tiny cat like this. But this guy can shrink down to three feet and go right in the front door. So that was why I chose them. And, um, and then because we ended up with so much fill, it was just, I, I designed it to put hyper adobe walls around the, the pool. But, uh, but when I started to see the piles and actually how much space the 18 inch hyper adobe, even if I could get it down to 12 inch, it was just sucking up space that could have trees in it. So. We, I ended up just cutting through uh, the, the sidewall and giving him a five foot width to go in and out. And he ended up taking this, uh, quite a lot of the fill, not all of it, out the south side of the greenhouse and creating a bit of a terrace, which was perfect because I had found some um, uh, evacuated tube solar, solar pipes uh, secondhand, which then that gave me a place to put them. So this is Dina, who I hired to help me do this job, and uh, we didn't I, we didn't have a design to start with. I I got I was trying to get information about what kind of material would be used that I could use that wouldn't collapse, that would allow me this forty foot length, that would uh, um, not rot. And you know, we went through many iterations. Um, people saying, "Yeah, you got to use treated wood and and um, like plywoods and things." and so uh, also we hit the water table at exactly four feet. So it was a godsend in a way because um, I was able to level it with that four foot, um, with that four foot depth. So, so, so uh, in the morning time, I would get my um, swimming pool pump and I would suck the water out of there. And then I would just fill in all the low spots. So. It was quite wonderful because when we finally put the liner in, um, it was so level that the first inch went all for 40 feet, you know, before it's kept filling and we were just like patting ourselves on the back. So uh, we used to get so far and then uh, I would say to her, I don't know what we can do now and, and like, like, why don't you go do another job for a week? Till we figure this out. So, but we did it, and I, I actually—that's what it looks like when it's finished, and it's fully insulated. It was—it's um, got uh, rigid styrofoam all, all under the liner there, and um, it's a, a lovely fool, uh, fool spool tool. <laughs> it's a great pool, and it has three purposes, and that's—and um, that is that it's um, rainwater collection, so that's ten thousand five hundred gallon addition to the. Uh, water storage. 
It's part of my thermal mass. I'm using that um, in winter heating. It's changed the game. I now uh, do not have to get up in the middle of the night because I can, I lose enough heat over the evening that that, uh, I can heat the pool up um, during the day and just turn the furnace off at night. So that's, uh, and then swimming. So this is what the mess looked like um, with all that extra fill and trying to, and the new trees that I brought in and uh, trying to figure out how are we gonna make this work? Um, and so of course, the hyper adobe fits in. I wanted to lift the soil on the south side to uh, use that space better. So there's kind of like a little terrace in there um, and pistachio trees are in the south side and then up higher are uh, tea plants and um, Buddha's hand and, and my vegetables. Like that's where I grow my, my beans and all, all sorts of stuff. And, um, and that's what it looks like now. Um, with uh, we made a patio because I you know I have workshops and then we get to use this space and you can see my alembic still back there where I have the methane line running into the greenhouse so I can um, do the distillation inside the greenhouse. And here's the evacuated tubes that I got and they're hooked in with just a simple swimming pool pump and filter and uh, when I first put it in I. I looked at the specs on these and I thought, you know, this thing doesn't create any heat at all. You know, it looks so disappointing to me. And so I just used PVC pipe um, on it. And then one day I came back and the, uh, and, and the um, heated end of the pipe was drooped like spaghetti because it really does create heat. I just didn't believe it did. So I had to prop that spaghetti thing up, turn the system off and let it get cold so that it would hold its side. And then we replaced it with a copper pipe. So that's what the pool looks like. And those little things are passion fruit. The passion fruit grow up over the swimming pool. And um, originally I was going to have uh, citrus that were going to be pruned to be on top of the pool, lemons and things like that. But the, the passion fruit is so productive and the chefs that I work with love it so much that I'm just gonna keep growing passion fruit on that. Most of the time the pool is covered and that's to keep the humidity down. Now, here's where we get into where I'm at now is that I'm, I'm really paying attention now to soil and to the plant nutrition. And I've been learning a lot about um, soil biology and looking at the plants and trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, this is a huge topic for me. I, I could probably talk for three hours on this, so I, I won't. I'll just tell you that I'm really into this. And what I do is I, I, um, I do leaf sap analysis. So I, I do monthly or every three weeks. I take samples of old leaves and new leaves of certain varieties. And I do avocados and I do navel oranges and kumquat right now because I have deficiency signs on kumquat. Um, and so that when I do the, the leaf sap analysis, I'm actually able to see exactly what the plant is taking in and what it's missing. You could have all of the things that are missing in a leaf sap in your soil, but because you don't have a balance of, um, because, because you don't have a healthy biology or biome, you aren't getting those um, macro or micronutrients delivered into the plant and up to, to the working areas. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm using these leaf sap to determine what my deficiencies or toxicities are. It, I don't have any toxicities. I would say what my higher level uh, nutrients are and using foliar applications of nutrients, bring the plant in balance. Because the key thing to understand is that when the plant, um, is photosynthesizing at its maximum. It's putting all these sugars in the soil that are feeding all the biology that are creating this symbiotic relationship where they're delivering what the plant requires as the plant requires it. So if you have a plant, you throw a bunch of fertilizer on the ground, you're not getting the, um, the biology relationship, the biological relationship um, working. So the plant is not photosynthesizing to the maximum and it's not feeding the bacteria. So here's, this is what kumquat 
often looks like in my greenhouse. And it's uh, a deficiency of um, calcium and um, phosphorus, but it's, it's so I, I, I really am focusing on this now. And this is a picture I took a while ago. The leaves are, I'm actually getting really good results. I should have had a photo here, but that's only through foliar applications of, um, of nutrient. So this becomes quite technical. Um, I'm also um, monitoring. Oh, I wanted to show you this. This is, this is uh, you see the picture on the left is, is a really healthy lettuce root. And that's what, if I pick, I would pick the trough cover off. I would see when the lettuce is really healthy, it's like silk, it's beautiful, but there's no root hairs. They don't need root hairs. So everything is being delivered to the plant. So it's super healthy. It's just like growing these glistening silvery white uh, roots. Whereas on the right, this is more what you're looking for is this um, mycorrhizal area with all this bacteria and fungi sort of stuck to the little roots and and you, and th this is, I just did this this morning. I was trying to find a, a picture of, 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 uh, of my soil, of, of this relationship that I'm trying to build with the soil that was sterile and trying to build biology. And this, this is a plant that's coming along, you know, it, it's, it's reason to feel hopeful. Um, one of the most important things about building soil is keeping the soil covered and the soil covered with at least four families, plant families. And this is what I've been learning with all my regen stuff. So now my greenhouses, there's, I'm trying to get all my sub soil covered with different plants. And if you can a, um, have a mixture of, of uh, legumes and um, the, uh, chrysanthemum family and um, short herbs, tall herbs, as well as these citrus, uh, you start to see the soil build, you start to see these, um, you know, the, uh, you just start to see a nice soil you can stick your hand in. And this is an interesting thing is that most gardeners have great soil because they do this. They just do this naturally. And especially if you go to like uh, traditional gardens in France or somewhere like that, you'll see the gardens look kind of messy, you know, and, but, but the soil is fabulous because the soil biology is, is, um, is, uh, is complex because there's all these different plants with all these different requirements for biology or different symbiotic relationships. So you end up building a very resilient um, soil. And one of the other things is that as you increase the organic matter of your soil, you're also increasing the water holding capacity. So if you had a soil that was 1% organic matter, you just bump that up through your work to 3%, you're increasing its water holding capacity by 90%. And this is a study done in 2010. So as, as, especially for me looking at dealing with water and you know, I'm just storing my water, um, I want a soil that's gonna hold that water. I want a plant that's gonna be able to take those cold temperatures in the winter and the soil biology is gonna help those plants to go through the winter because there's more sugars in the soil, things are functioning at lower temperatures. These are all the kinds of things I'm thinking about now. Who's in the garden? So it, one of the ways I'm building biology is by uh, using these Johnson Sioux bioreactors. And this is a, I have a YouTube on this if you want to learn more about it. Um, I'm, this is the only way I'm composting now. Um, you, you have these, uh, you fill them up at one, at one time, like you, you fill them up, you have everything ready and then you put them in. So there, these, these uh, silos are on top of a um, pallet. And then they have, as you fill them, you have these, um, these four inch pipes that are spaced so that you have never more than 12 inches away from an oxygen source. So you fill the whole container up. And then after a week, it goes through a thermophilic phase. And then you just pull those pipes out. And you're left with these holes that let the air flow all the way through. And you need to water this stuff 
as well. You can set up an automated water system and give it a, a minute and a half a day. Um, you end up after one year with the material, and, and also you add worms at some point. So you're, you're getting um, the castings in there. Um, but what you end up after a year with is something almost like a clay type sub substance. These things are being used all over um, the States and uh, Australia, all over the place with really mostly commercial growers, like big fields. They'll take a liter of this and, uh, this material and put it in a 50 gallon container of water, mix it up and then spray it as uh, inoculant on their fields and see great results. So this is uh, what I've been doing on my place is, is trying to use this. I've harvested one of them already. Um, it's way more than what I would need. I took it off early because I needed um, something in the greenhouse, but um, I threw some stuff on top of it later, but this is essentially what it looks like. And I did this little, uh, where is it? This little video here um, just yesterday and looking and you can see it, it's dropped about two and a half feet or two feet maybe. And this this one is uh, this one is about nine months old, and uh, you can see a little worm squirreling around there, quite full of worm. But it's very moist and very very nice. You can grab a, a handful of it and it'll hold its shape. Oh, so. Sorry, this is oh dear. Hang on, technical glitch. It does it wants to grab me at this one. How do I get out of here? Oh, here. Okay. So then here's a picture of, I, I don't know, you can probably recognize this is some um, um, vermiculture castings. I, I brought in some soil to, um, to uh, build up an area that didn't have any soil. It was just subsoil. And uh, this soil I brought in just had nothing in it. I looked at, at it under the microscope and I just thought, oh, this isn't really all that useful. So um, I ended up spreading it out over my lawn a bit. And now I just go along the edge and I scoop it up and it's full of castings and worms. So I'm just taking this stuff as, it, as it's created by the worms and just scooping it up and taking it in the greenhouse and, and putting it because of course I didn't have any worms in there either because it's just cut off. So this is right now, this is um, flowering. This is a kaffir lime, a little pretty flower coming on. And uh, this is what the avocados look like right now. Um, I, like I was saying, there's a bit of an issue around um, pollination. I bring in bumblebees every year and the, the hive I brought in um, must have been dropped in transport because it didn't. it's not working, but I have another one coming in two days. So hopefully I'll get decent pollination on the avocados. And I just pulled off the last of the oranges and mandarins yesterday and sold them all today and that's what the oranges look like that would be Washington and the flowers today you can see the little green new new uh, oranges there on some of the wow. this is uh I I mostly sell what I create to chefs and this is a picture taken by um, one of the people that she she makes beautiful desserts and uh, she took this photo. This is a restaurant on Galliano. This is uh, Josh Blumenthal. He's um, a chef with Trinket Mali Supper Club. And, and he he's one of my great customers because he's on a on a hundred mile diet and he trained in um, worked in California for years and years. So just really into citrus and all of a sudden no citrus for years and years when he was up here. And now he's got citrus again. And because I have 35 varieties, I never have like a massive amount of one type. I have little bits or I have 20 pounds of this or that. And it's perfect for chefs. So we can walk through and smell and taste and say, okay, it's fun. So there's another one of his desserts. 
they do all kinds of interesting things. There's a business on the island that takes um, my produce and she makes artisan vinegars with it. And then there's this dessert maker here that is just unbelievable. This is Love Scalettes and she's, uh, you can see passion fruit in there and various types of citrus and she candies it and she, she just does. And these really pretty little pink things are, um, are the insides of finger lime. And you can see the, the little bits of finger lime around the edge. That's a, a, sh a chef's uh, favorite because it looks like caviar. So if you went to a certain restaurant, they would say um, that a dessert had caviar on it. It would be finger lime. Mm. And of course, one needs bougainvillea. And then I wanted to say, um, notice that these people had taken photos and uh, I, I um, guiding results. Yeah, so and this is, I have an, a really lovely garden outside too. And I have a lot of fruit and nut trees and um, oops, that's it. So that's my, uh, my presentation. Wow, bravo, love it. Thank you, Jane, yes. oh my gosh. So I you welcome any questions. Yes, there are a couple, but I was just going to say you talk about you could talk for another three hours on soil and I wrote you down. I'm going to come after you on that one. Okay. <laughs> I want to hear I want to hear your three hours on soil. So Jane, we have two questions. One, do you this is from one person, uh, A.S. Jones, do you thin the fruit? And two, do you have issues with scale? Um, my calamondin, because of how dense the leaves are on the branches, is forever struggling with scale. Um, what was the first question? Do you thin the fruit? Oh, no, uh, generally not. No, I, I let the tree do that. Though, you know, they, they're right now, they, um, some varieties, I definitely need to prune branches off because they they'll just send a lot out. And um, then regarding scale, no, so no, I don't I don't thin though. You know, maybe the trees tend to do it themselves. They they kind of figure out how much they can handle. Though, if I wanted to get really big Oro Blanco grapefruit, I should probably thin. So up to you. Regarding scale, I always find it hard to thin, right? Because you, you, you know, you, you, you want every piece of fruit you can get. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, generally the tree knows what it can handle. But um, regarding insects, that's a that's a really interesting one because I would say that every single tree I've ever bought has come with something on it, like. Um, I have, I, I have cottony cushion scale in there. I have scale, I have mealybugs. Um, I do not use any sprays at all. I don't, I, I look at insect issues as me not meeting the needs of the plant. So I, I stopped using soaps years ago because um, the beneficial insects, and I would actually buy some, some in the early years. Um, the beneficial insects are put off by soapy smells. So you have, we have naturally occurring predators for some of these. And one of the predators that we have for scale and for mealybugs is actually um, wasps. And, um, but you will see ants, of course, they, they also will um, farm scale. Um, so so uh, scale, is, I have I have a story of somebody that brought me um, a Valencia orange that she had on her patio, and she um, it, when she brought it she said I just can't get it to, I give it all the love that I ever had and it's still not growing but she never gave it fertilizer so or any kind of food so the thing was practically white and was covered with scale, and when I have a tree like that I will put an audio book on my in head earphones and I'll sit down on the stool outside and I will clean the whole tree off with um, hydrogen peroxide just wipe it off 
and then I will um, make sure to use a spray, like a not, like a high volume water spray, at least once a week, so that any time you have any emerging babies, that that they're going to be washed right off because the soil they'll eat them. You know, whatever's in the soil is going to eat those little guys that wash off. Um, I squish scale if I see them, but I know what you mean when I have a Kishu mandarin, which um, has really tiny little branches and little tiny, everything's little tiny, little tiny fruit. And it's very clustered. And it is, it, it's one I've had problems with scale, but I'm not worrying about it too much now that I'm really paying attention to um, the health of my soil. <laughs> Sounds funny, eh? But, um, I'm, I'm working through this and, and it's kind of an interesting um, change for me because if I see a tree with a disease now, I don't think I got to get rid of that tree. I think, you know, um, I'm not meeting this tree's needs. And to, to, to ex go a little bit further with this, um, you may be familiar with this citrus psyllid in, Cal in um, Florida. It's just wiping out citrus orchards just it's very very serious it's a disease that's carried by an insect that was brought in from Asia by mistake and it, it has devastated so a lot of the oranges um a lot of the citrus that we're eating has been sprayed with so much stuff to try to get rid of this citrus greening it's called so that the, the citrus never ripens properly and just recently I read an article in the I, I get the citrus um I get the citrus uh, newsletter from, from Florida. There is a farmer there who's using regen agriculture, these systems I, that I'm trying and using and, and cover crops and, uh, and he is getting fruit ripening. He's the only person he's not spraying with the stuff. And so there is a way to work through this. It's, it's an indicator for us that we need to deal with our soils. And granted, a lot of people are growing this stuff in pots. And I am not a pot person, like, I mean, that kind of pot, but, you know, I, I don't grow well in pots. It, and I, you know, if someone does, my hat's off to you, because that requires uh, some real skill. Yeah. Well, we're getting a few more questions here. Thanks for answering those so well. Um, a question on your compost tea, Jane, are you using it? as a foliar spray for your citrus i'm right now i'm i'm not using my um my stuff i'm using uh products that i'm that i purchased from um uh Terralink. and it's um they're specific types and i'm i'm experimenting with them but it's all part of this thing about doing leaf sap analysis so i'm um I'm no, I'm targeting specific things, but if, if, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing very specialized stuff with that, but I am using foliars. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to ask a question off of that one. Would it be possible for people who are making their own compost and feel confident in its uh, you know, being a good compost uh, to use on, on their citrus fruits, their own compost spray? Compost. Uh, I think if you're a good compost maker, you know, you should definitely try and, 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 you know, if you do one tree and see if you notice a difference and you, you know, with a foliar, you'll notice a difference within the week, you know, if you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, foliar is very fast, isn't it? Okay, another question here for you, please, Jane. Um, do you use different soils for different plants? A different soil mix, depending on the plant? No, I don't. I, everything is, um, I'm aiming just to build soil everywhere, just like build help. And I, I, uh, I have two sort of generations of soil because I have the soil that I did in, in 2014 in half the greenhouse. And then I have this new soil that's only, um, it's not even two years old. So um, it's like a year and a half. So it's a very young soil, but I know more than I knew then. So now I'm building faster. Like I'm understanding how to do that faster. Yeah, no, I'm not doing anything special. Like most citrus, they'll tell you avocados don't like wet feet. 
and um you know citrus they're all shallow sort of shallow rooted but i just have what i have you know i i'm not i, I they they're just gonna have to figure out how to do it so <laughs> Love it. Love your approach. Uh, <clears throat> we have a question here for you. How do you let the bees in to pollinate your avocados in the fall? The avocados are are flowering right now, so they're spring flowering. Um, I have I have roll up vents. I have vents on either side of my greenhouse that go up about three, three feet, three and a half feet. Um, they're each, one's on the north, one's on the south. They have um, their own thermostat. So I can, do, I can set how high, what temperature is, whatever. And so for different months or different times of the year, I'll set my vents differently. So right now I'm just, um, they just open at uh, 65 or something and mm. they, uh, they close when, they they go up and down all day, so the bees and the pollinators are going in and out, and the bee and birds. I have lots of birds that like sometimes in the morning when I walk in the front door, the bird flies over my shoulder to get in there. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> and then I have frogs in there, and it's really lovely. Yeah. Oh yes, I love that picture of the basil with the frog nestled in yeah. there. Nancy is asking again about soil, just to clarify that the soil for the avocado would be the same kind of soil that you use for the citrus? It's the same soil and the, the with avocados, they love to have their leaves stay there. So when the leaves drop, they want the leaves there. And um, I tend to take the citrus because I, I am, um, they're prickly and, and um, they're thorny. So I tend to chip those and then I, I put those in the Johnson Sioux and then I, I will spread that as a compost. But the, all the avocado leaves drop and, um, and then I put straw on top of that to, um, in the summertime and we'll actually just put it out yesterday um, just to keep things moist. They don't like to dry out especially when they're when they're going through pollination this is a it's really hard to get an avocado to pollinate here i don't i don't know that bob duncan he started at the same time as me i don't know that he's had a full fruit yet he's had the what we call cukes which is a partially pollinated um fruit but not not the one with the seed so um right now so so i have still fruit the other interesting thing about avocados is that I have two different varieties that fruit, they all fruit at the same time, they pollinate at the same time, but some of them are ready after one year or like 14 months. And, and another variety I have is ready after 18 months. So I actually have avocados that I'm still eating on those trees from the pollination the year before last. That are still on the tree itself? They're still on the tree and they're not going to fall off. They'll, they'll finish their ripening when I pick them. Wow. That's but, awesome. Yeah, it is. But the other variety that ripens earlier, if I left it on, then the seed would germinate inside the fruit. You know, so kind of interesting. It would germinate inside so, the fruit. The seed yeah, would so, actually start to grow inside yeah, the fruit. Yeah, so you'll see the little root root hairs coming out or little roots and oh my uh, goodness yeah so I have probably about 20 20 maybe more of my avocado pits that I will graft maybe this year yeah wow um okay so tell us how we wanted to grow an avocado from an organic avocado that we bought how, how would we go about doing it from the seed well, you would just do what everybody does. You know, they just, they're really easy to germinate. Um, and then <clears throat> when you got it to a certain size, then uh, you would graft on a producer. So at some point I will ma I make that available, you know, um, scion for grafting. Because you won't Excellent. get fruit, you won't get fruit out of that tree unless you graft it. 
you might get and it in 25 might years. You be moving in that direction to supply the grafting or? Yeah, I'm, so are I'm you, not. Are you selling trees that you're? No, oh, no. no. My thing is I'm I'm retired, right? So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not interested Sorry. in building a in building a, a, a the bit that that other side of the business. Um, I'm I'm very much interested in the um, I never I I'm really interested in the knowledge uh, in learning. Like I'm monitoring soil temperatures and moisture, and I'm right through the winter because avocados and well, citrus isn't supposed to be able to do any nutrient uptake below 10. So how are these guys doing? So I'm, I'm monitoring these along with the leaf sap. So I'm, I'm keeping data and I'm building spreadsheets and maps and things. And that's my interest is, is wow. that it's not, it's not to become a nursery yeah. or anything like that. So. Hi, I don't, this is the first time. You're a natural born engineer. Yes, somebody wants to say something. Go ahead, Diane. So thank you for having me. Anyway, so where do you live? Like, how are these citrus and avocados growing? Well, they're in a greenhouse. Uh, I mean, in, in like BC? Yeah, I'm on Salt Spring. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Because so I didn't know where you were going with that because people are like, oh, grow an avocado tree. Oh, that's good. In 40 years, it'll produce something. So, but you've had something going? And with all due respect, of Diane, course, did you just add, join us? Have you? No, but the same you? Entire, uh, oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Um, I well, I'm, I'm going to just ask if we can move forward and, and come back to you if we have time, Diane. We have quite mm -hmm. a few questions queued oh. up here already. Um, we'll really try to get oh. back to you, Diane. Sorry I about that. Jane, um, Aaron is asking, is there anywhere uh, on the North Island, like where we are, Campbell River, Quadra, Cortez, where we can actually buy your citrus fruit? No. Uh, I think he's no. meaning the citrus. If not, uh, where perhaps in Salt Spring can we find it? Is that possible? No, <laughs> you won't find it because I, I it's all oh, sold. No. It's pretty much, okay. I, I have, if I ever have excess and, and actually in the, in the winter time when COVID isn't happening, then I would have a citrus sale in December and I would have an open house and people could come and see, and you know, buy citrus. But I, I've um, kind of hooked in with a bunch of chefs and I'm really loving that. It's a, uh, it's a good way. So if I find I have excess, I, I can, you know, just go to the local list and and put it on but um yeah it's less and less Ooh, sure I, you know the yuzu for example demand. what it's high i'm demand. sure there's an endless demand there is yeah <laughs> um from michelle she's saying i'm in penticton and i'm growing these two trees from organic kits that she bought from the store so I guess, uh, I guess she means citrus and avocado. Uh, Sherry's asking if the presentation will be available as a recording. Yes, Sherry, we have a YouTube channel now with all of our gabbing about gardening Zooms uh, for gardeners. So go to our Facebook page or to Instagram and you can watch Jane all over again, um, which I think a lot of people are going to want to do. Uh, now we have a question from, oh, nope, you answered that one. Hold on here. Okay, pool uses. You said that your uses for the pool are swimming, water storage, and thermal heat. Is that right, Jane? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, what are the advantages of foliar spraying uh, compared to adding organic fertilizer? Um, well, I think adding, oh, organic fertilizer. Um, 
you're kind of guessing unless you have analysis done, um, you know, whether the plant needs the organic fertilizer. Um, you're, if you're starting, if you, you know, there's, there's sort of a saying that, uh, you know, all plants could you even in a regenerative agriculture, there's, there's this guy, um, Sticka, there's a really good book uh, about soils that I, I would recommend. It's by John Sticka. And um, yeah, have a look for it. And, and it will, it'll demystify a lot of this stuff. And, and you can, because to explain a really good answer to that question would take a bit of time. But if you're going light on organic fertilizer, yeah, okay. But every time you add fertilizer, you are, unless you know exactly what you need, you are, you may be displacing some kind of um, natural process that would be otherwise delivering the food. If you put a lot of fertilizer on a garden, um, like a lot of nitrogen, well, your nitrogen uh, bacteria is, is, is no longer got a job. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the more you understand, it's really worth learning more about soils. It's, it's complicated, but it's also sort of a, a metaphor for our bodies too, about how we work and how we take in food and the importance of our, our biology and of maintaining that and encouraging that. It's not a great answer, but a soil owner's no, man, just go and, and find answer. that book, just a second. It's a fascinating book. Oh, here, Kate is saying John Sticka, S-T-I-K-A, is Soil Owner's Manual. And I will put this on our Facebook page as well, Jane. Sorry, so you, that... you know about that? I'm sorry, missed that. You know that book? Well, Kate knows it. I didn't know it. Fortunately, somebody else here does. And um, she's given us the name of it. And I'll post it on the Facebook page. Yeah. Another book that I think is really great is um, Nicole Masters' book, For the Love of Soil. It's a really great book. And, and it's also really exciting to hear about what's happening around the world. She's a New Zealander, but she works all over North America. She's worked with she, remarkable results with a huge farm um, in the Peace River. And... Um, ranchers in the states and all over the place it's pretty cool yeah it, it's it is a fascinating topic this is the one i'm reading right now the hidden half of nature the microbial roots of life and health uh -huh. this is from a couple in, in seattle <clears throat> he's a <clears throat> geomorphologist and she's a biologist and environmental planner and they they really get into the microbes in soil and how we've overlooked them for far too long. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question for you. <clears throat> oh, and somebody is also saying The Intelligent Gardener by Steve Solomon is a great book. Thanks yeah. for that, Kathy. Dawn is asking, what vegetation are you adding to your compost system? Um, you're adding manure, leaves, seaweed, what else? I don't add, well, I add, I add um, digestate, that's my manure, right? Digestate from the, I don't get other manure. <laughs> Just what's on my farm. Right. I, I have um, mostly uh, wood chips. You know, I, I chip my um, prunings. And uh, I have, uh, if I see a, a truck drive by with some dug for chips or, or, you know, like ditch stuff, I, I nab them and tell them to come and dump a load. And then I throw a whole mess of digestate on top of that and cover it and leave it for a year. And then I'll chip it finer and then use it in my Johnson Sioux. And the tight. <clears throat> So the really? digestate, are you making that yourself? From well, that's, your, the, uh, that's, what the, that's what the anaerobic digester is always doing. It's always making it. Okay. So Great. And yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of wood chips too. It's always great to hear a 
another person talk about wood chips. Well, we're coming up to five o'clock. We've covered everybody's questions. Jane, I'm blown away. I'm amazed. Uh, you seem to be only not a, a fabulous gardener, but a, a, an engineer who has designed a phenomenal system. Are you still consulting uh, as well? So if people would like to reach out to you, uh, do you do paid consultations? I do, um, but I'm trying not to do anything right now for a few months. I just um, came out of a really busy time and I'm, I just want to enjoy the summer, get my boat on the water and take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so. Yeah. Well, good for you. We won't we, we <laughs> won't hammer you with all kinds of requests. Then you've done you've yeah. done your duty. I'm so so grateful. I know everyone else here is. Uh, this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Everybody, just a reminder that gabbing about gardening is based on the gift economy. It's all by donations. We give freely and we appreciate what you give back to keep us going so that we can have amazing people like Jane Squire join us. So if you'd like to gift back uh, in the chat box, you'll see the e-transfer address where you can contribute to Gabby about gardening. Jane, I'd like to give our guest teachers, um, our, our garden speakers, the last word every week. What are, what are your parting words of advice and encouragement to us gardeners? Well, I, I think that um, it's, it's such an exciting time to be a gardener. And um, I think your, pro, your, your program's really great. You're, you're getting, getting some really interesting people. And um, there's so much information out there that we can learn from. And um, yeah, good on you, you know, and uh, great questions. and. And we just carry on trying to make our places healthier. And I, you know, actually there, there is one thing I didn't say, which is that like locally, when I look out my greenhouse and I'm so focused on it, I'm looking at the forest and I'm seeing that there isn't a complicated undergrowth there anymore. And there's a project on our island where people are learning how to get understory plants going and how to get our forest back to its very diverse nature. And part of what's missing is, is like the animal part of it because things are disrupted, but we can make up for that. And we can like get in there and, and affect change, get things healthier in our forest too. So it's not just about growing veggies. It's about, it's about uh, regenerating. And I guess that term drives some people nuts, but it's true. It's more than sustainable. It's, it's regenerating. So I think we all can really be part of that and on our little pieces of land because most of us are farmers or gardeners or so, you know, so that's. Beautiful. Carry on team, all Beautiful of us. words of advice. <laughs> carry on and get, get, go beyond the garden gate and think of the whole planet yeah. as a garden yeah. and, and yeah. think food, food forest canopy so that we yeah. can restore the whole planet, mama. Mama needs us. I love that. Carry on and make our places healthier. That's quotable, Jane. Thank you so, okay. so much. It's been a delight. I've, I've, I've hung on every word. Thank you, everybody. Watch for the recording. Bye. It will be on Facebook. Now Thank go outside you. and get dirty. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. I'm just thrilled. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Enjoy your week. Bye-bye.